So this conception of uh, liberty, which is informed by economic theory, is new in a historical perspective. Antiquity did not have this conception of liberty. The Greeks had a conception of liberty, but this conception of liberty was confined to the political community. There was no liberty outside of the political community, outside of the police. Outside of the police, there was only conflict and risky behavior. For the Romans, it was the same thing. The Romans had a concept of liberty within the empire, but not outside of the empire. There was no notion of how people belonging to different political communities could be involved in an overarching network of peaceful exchange. This did not exist. There was a Pax Romana only to the extent that the confines of the empire reached. And then within the empire, the Romans created something that was indeed unheard of and necessary for the advancement of uh, modern civilization, namely the concept of universal law or natural law. The Romans were the inventors of natural law. And the way they, they did it was because uh, they had to rule over different peoples, and the different peoples had different law codes, exactly as Professor Hopper has explained to us uh, just an hour ago. Right, so this is not just a theoretical exercise. Right? He said we can have different uh, insurance companies and they might offer product differentiation. Some group might be ruled according to mosaic law, another group according to canon law, and et cetera, et cetera. This was the actual practice in the Roman Empire. Right? So we had different groups, they had different laws, and they were judged according to this law. But then there was still the problem of regulating the relationships between these different groups. So what if a member of the Jewish uh, nation, or at the time there were no nation of the Jewish tribe, got in, in conflict with a Phoenician merchant and so on? What had to happen then? So then the Roman uh, emperors uh, encouraged the uh, formation of a universal law code that would apply to such cases of conflicts. And the this law code was, at the beginning, formulated by uh, one major civil servant. So he set up uh, all the, the set of rules according to experience, right? They, they, they judged the different cases and said, so in this case, we have to, uh, we could apply this principle because it was a universal principle. And so they had a list of all these stipulations and later on systematized this list and so on. And it was revised more or less every year, right? So it's a uh, constant improvement. Uh, of, of the product, so, so to say, and eventually, as a result of uh, many hundreds of years of experience in educating cases, the Romans had developed a whole uh, law book, a code of law, of universal law, applying to all nations, and this is the corpus juris uh, that uh, came into full uh, definition in the fifth, uh, in the beginning of the sixth century. Now, but still, right, this universal law was not strictly speaking a concern to be universal beyond the borders of the empire. This is an idea that no Roman had. It held only within the empire. Things changed then after the collapse of the Roman Empire and the emergence of a new intellectual movement in the Middle Ages, which was scholasticism about which we also heard already this afternoon. In uh, our lecture on uh, epistemology, so we had this uh, scholastic movement that arrived with uh, uh, Albert the Great and uh, Albertus Magnus and then uh, St. Thomas, and which uh, strived to find natural law not only in the analysis of nature, and not only uh, try to, um, uh, uh, so not only, the, well, I mean, uh, should, should be got, uh, start more fundamentally, the main concern of the churchmen was always the salvation of the soul. But they pushed the, pushed the analysis further away. So they were asking the question, why do people sin? And why do people fall into temptation and so on? So they, for many centuries, they just acquired the individual soul, but eventually they came to extend this analysis to the environment of individual human beings. So they started 
analyzing natural forces. It started analyzing nature, physics, bio biology, and so on. And they eventually also turned to the laws of society. So all this was new, and all this came into full swing in the 13th century. Now, the churchmen, this uh, uh, new uh, scholasticism, this new intellectual movement, operated under different conditions. They were present in all countries, and there were now different countries that had succeeded the Roman Empire, and cooperated with one another without a common code of law. Uh, there was no empire, no one political community that imposed its rule on all countries. There were now different countries with different citizens cooperating amongst one another, but also with the citizens of other countries. So now the, the concept of natural law had acquired a, a whole new meaning. It now really meant it was clear that natural law stretched beyond the, any political community and that it covered humanity as a whole. And in this uh, conception, of course, the concept of private property played a central role. Right? So you have, in, in, in uh, Catholic doctrine, you have four so-called cardinal virtues. You have uh, uh, prudence, justice, uh, temperance. Oh, wow. I don't remember what the fourth one was. Uh, well, uh, it will come back later. This is probably one of my sins, yeah. They're always weak. I'm surprised that I remember temperance. Um, the, so the, the crucial uh, virtue is prudence, which encovers anything that uh, pertains for us today to intellectual life. So it doesn't mean uh, prudence uh, being careful and so on. It means uh, circumspection, taking into consideration all circumstances that determine our course of action, both in the present and in the future. And uh, second to this virtue was only the virtue of uh, justice. And at the center of this uh, virtue of justice is the concept of suum coequal, to each according to what is due to him. And what is due to each uh, person uh, is, in fact, his property. So private property was at the center of uh, thinking about justice uh, and universal justice as from the Middle Ages. Then came the Reformation, and the Reformation, it was, it was a Protestant movement, did not at all aim, as, it, as you might uh, think, by watching what is going on in the Protest certain Protestant churches, especially in Europe uh, today, did not at, at all aim at overthrowing the established moral order and the established uh, virtues, but precisely at reinforcing them. And so the Protestants, thought that the Catholics were in fact, in fact too, too lax. Right? That was the reason Luther uh, went to, to Rome and, and uh, thought he had come to Sodom and Gomorrah. So thought this is way too lax. I mean, the Catholics have fallen from, uh, from the faith. Right? They are no longer just. They're no longer prudent. They will all go to hell. And uh, we need to reform the church that is bringing back into the form in which it, into which it was brought by the creator of the church, namely by Jesus Christ. So as from the Reformation then, so we're talking at the beginning of the uh, 16th century, come about two or 300 years of fierce religious competition between the Catholic Church on the one hand and various Protestant denominations on the other hand, all vying for the best definition of what the true moral order is. These things only changed in the 20th century. In the 20th century, the Protestant churches have uh, started competing in the opposite direction, that is, uh, trying to come up with new definitions that would allow Christians not to adhere to traditional uh, standards of moral behavior. And this is uh, the reason for the decline of most Protestant denominations today. So in any case, so the point is then, as a consequence of this competition and uh, religious pro production encouragement of moral behavior, we created the condition in Europe and in the offsprings of European culture in the various colonies in the Americas, but also in Asia and in Africa, right, for the operation of uh, uh, spontaneous societies that did not have to rely on a monopolist law enforcer. Right? Societies, by and large, functioned independent of the presence of an emperor, of one monopolist police organization. 
Now this, then, were the condition under which one group of the scholastic uh, intellectual movement of the scholastics, namely the, the school of Salamanca, right? so uh, Spanish and Italian theologians uh, headquartered in the Spanish city of Salamanca, discovered for the first time uh, the existence of what Hayek would later call a spontaneous order. Right? The market economy and the economy as a whole could function by and large independent of the existence of governments. Right? The market, it, it was a, a self-enforcing order. And it relied on moral behavior, spontaneous moral behavior from all its participants. And in itself, it encouraged such, such behavior because the liberty that existed was an order liberty that enforced responsibility. And if you enforce responsibility, if the negative consequences of your choices fall back on yourself, then you have interest in acting prudently and uh, respecting traditional moral standards of behavior, which are not just decoration, but precisely protect you against adverse uh, consequences of, of choices and bad choices. So the school of Salamanca, for the first time, discovered uh, uh, this, uh, the existence of a spontaneous order. Right? There are laws of society that have not been enacted by any legislation, that have not been enacted by any king or tyrant and so on, but are regularities that exist independent of human willing. And successful uh, economies are ruled by those laws and violations of those laws entailed negative consequences for the economy as a whole. The next step, and this was a crucial breakthrough, arrived in the 18th century with the discoveries, uh, with the discoveries of the uh, causes of uh, the wealth of nations, to uh, adopt the, the title of Adam Smith's famous treatise. Right? Adam Smith was fairly unoriginal as far as individual points of, uh, of this intellectual edifice uh, were concerned, but he was uh, the, the writer who brought all of this together into one picture. So Adam Smith, for the first time, uh, created a literary work that presented the operation of uh, the developed market economy, a relatively developed market economy, and pointed the true forces of material progress, the true forces of uh, causes of material progress for society as a whole were not, uh, as most people at the time had it, government intervention in the form of trade policy, what we would call uh, today trade policy, and in the form of monetary interventionism, but the, cause, the true causes of wealth were the division of labor and capital accumulation. So we had then at the end of the 18th century reached a new uh, stage, right? We had for the first time developed a theory of liberty. Adam Smith talked of the natural uh, condition of liberty, of the, the junction of natural law, the, the junction of a, a new definition of liberty. Uh, with a combination of economic theory. Right? So the defense of liberty was not only uh, made in moral terms, not in theological terms, but now also in economic terms. And the disciples of Adam Smith, the classical economists, would reinforce this consideration over the next century. Among them was Frederick uh, Bastiat, whom I already, already mentioned. So he has a couple of uh, famous papers which I encourage you to read in case you haven't done it, and also Leandro to translate them in case it hasn't yet been done. And for example, his essay on the law, or his essay on uh, uh, property and, uh, and freedom, 